everyone. Welcome to Ecosystem Talks. My name is Maria Yulia, and I'm a chief of staff here at Ecomap. I'm joined by Francesca Ofreda, who is the founder and CEO of Breakthrough Strategy Partners, which is a consultancy that creates strategies for businesses, governments, and nonprofits to build vibrant and thriving communities. Hi, Francesca. Welcome. How are you? Hi, Maria. It's great to be with you today. Yeah, great to be with you too. Um, so to get us started and get the audience acquainted in with you, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you got into the field of economic development? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I grew up in a diverse community right outside of the Washington, D.C. area, product of public schools. I think it's actually the most diverse zip code in the entire country. So I had friends from every socioeconomic background, religion, race, and it was you know su such a privilege to get to experience that diversity. And I didn't quite realize how unique it was early in my life. Um, but what I also saw firsthand was the way that place and opportunity can really impact the trajectory of an individual's life. Um, and I saw the divergent paths that some of my classmates took, um, you know, related to whether they had transportation options, if they were able to get healthcare, um, whether they were able to attend higher education. And coming from an immigrant heritage myself, I think, you know, both my grandparents are really kind of the American dream story, if you will, I always felt six degrees of separation from having potentially a, a very different life and kind of a, acutely aware of the opportunities and the privileges that I had had, frankly. Um, and so that really sparked this lifelong desire to create economic opportunities for others. Um, and I've been fortunate to do this in different capacities in different sectors throughout my career. But what motivates me today is the same thing that motivated me then. And it's really kind of how do we tap into and harness and bring to bear the potential of everyone so that we can live better, more meaningful and, and fulfilled lives and, and build stronger communities. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and I know you've had a diverse set of career experiences well across the public, private and social sectors um, and internationally as well and across the United States. Can you tell us a little bit more about your career journey? Absolutely. Um, so initially, you know, early on in childhood and, and life, I was very focused internationally and particularly in Latin America, grew up with kind of with that, that international uh, flavor in my house. And so I thought I wanted a career in international development. Um, right out of college, I received a research Fulbright fellowship um, to spend a year in Bogota, Colombia. Um, doing research on the country's flagship poverty alleviation program and kind of the understand the effectiveness that it was having in terms of upward mobility. And that was a, an incredible experience. But what it also showed me was the importance of the private sector in creating good jobs, in investing in local communities. And that really sparked my interest in learning about business. Um, so after that Fulbright experience, I came back to the States and um, I figured that the best way to quickly learn and understand the business world um, was as a management consultant where I could get exposed to so many industries and client challenges and kind of project types. Um, so I started working for Deloitte Consulting originally out of the, the San Francisco office. And during those early years, I you know was on the road like a good, good consultant. Um, and I spent uh, much time in, in emerging markets working on growth strategies, global supply chains, kind of you know partnership, mark, product market fit opportunities. Um, and what I saw through that experience was the way that you know too often business and policy existed in isolation but really how you needed to have people that could speak across both kind of the, the, the nonprofit, the business, the social sector worlds, um, because they don't work in isolation and policy has implications on business and business can shape policy. Um, so that really inspired me to uh, pursue a joint degree at Harvard Business School and Harvard Kennedy School. Um, and uh, through that experience, when I got to um, the Kennedy School, I realized that I was always looking outside, but there were so many problems in our own backyard. Um, and where I was seeing the most innovation was really at the local level. Um, and I felt that cities, communities, regions were petri dishes for experimentation and innovation. Um, so I had some experiences working for several mayors, Rahm Emanuel in the city of Chicago, Mitch Landrieu in New Orleans, kind of getting to experience firsthand, apply that consulting toolkit kind of, you know, to the problems facing everyday people in cities. And that gave me a real appreciation 
sort of the challenges um, at, at the ground level and kind of the need to manage all of these stakeholders um, and constituencies. Um, ended up going back to Deloitte uh, with a kind of a sharpened focus on regional economic development efforts. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of those projects. Um, I was also the chief of staff for the firm Smart City Practice, really thinking about how do we incorporate technology um, to really kind of shape uh, individual lives and, and be able to optimize kind of what, what cities have. Um, after several more years um, as a consultant at Deloitte, um, I was working with a lot of regional kind of business alliances on strategies on how they could promote jobs and economic growth. And I loved that, but I wanted to do it in kind of an operator capacity, taking all of these kind of strategies and ideas I had worked on and be able to implement them and do that in the place where I grew up. So um, I, I got recruited to join the Greater Washington Partnership, which I'll also talk more about, which is a CEO business alliance of the largest employers in the Baltimore to Richmond area. Um, and I was brought in to stand up an inclusive growth initiative in the middle of, of COVID. Um, all, all that kind of fast forward, and I have since started uh, my own consulting practice, Breakthrough Strategy Partners, which I'll, I'll share more about as well. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. And given all of these different experiences, what specifically inspired you to start Breakthrough Strategy Partners, and what was your vision there? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, throughout my career, I've been fortunate to have exposure to many countries, organizations, industries, and I think that's given me a unique and I'll say kind of well-rounded perspective. Um, and I also got to apply kind of those, those diversity of consulting experience as an operator at the partnership. And that helped me, you know, understand how difficult it is to actually operationalize these these strategies. You know, they look great on a PowerPoint slide, um, but when you have to bring it to life, you know, that's where the people and the organizational elements really come into play. Um, I, I think too, my parents are small business owners, so I always had that mental roadmap and framework. I've been quite entrepreneurial throughout my life. Um, and I had worked at the international level and then kind of across the country, then hyper regional at the partnership. Um, and I saw starting Breakthrough Strategy Partners as a way to bring all those experience sets together and to broaden out, um, to have kind of a diversity of clients, startups, local, national nonprofits, higher education, cities and regions. Now, that was a really exciting moment to think about things like you know, strategy, um, what sort of kind of alliances need to be made at the local level or national, how kind of, you know, you fund these big ideas um, and, and how we can, you know, work together, frankly, to build better futures today. What have some of the biggest learnings and surprises um, been for you since launching your own business? Well, uh, I'll tell you, Maria, I have so much admiration for small business owners and just an appreciation for what it takes to as you know, while well, working at a startup to kind of truly run a, a company, um, whether it's taxes and registration, cost structure and staffing, there's so much that goes in um, to, to running a business. And so um, I think getting to experience that has um, has really kind of, I would say, made me a better um, business professional, but also just, you know, no matter the size of the business, every business is having to deal with these same things. And so um, I, I think that's important for us to always remember. From a kind of client perspective, um, a few big learnings. I think, you know, just the centrality of the talent question, every organization, no matter the sector, no matter the type is, you know, grappling with these questions of, you know, getting and retaining top talent. Um, because ultimately, you know, my firm belief and kind of what I've seen is it's people that make organizations that make cities and communities thrive. And so you need to have a, a committed uh, staff. And that's challenging. And it's especially challenging in kind of the, the new hybrid remote workforce that we have today, um, because there are questions on how do you build that organizational culture? How do you promote flexibility? while keeping everyone aligned and moving forward. And I think we're all still learning and um, kind of finding our way through that. And so I've, I've seen that firsthand. I think the other thing is that all sorts of companies, industry sectors are, are also grappling with this changing landscape, right? You have AI, you have you know unprecedented levels of federal funding coming directly into the communities. And so having to be nimble and adapt to these changing realities is also something that's top of mind for, for many organizations. 
For sure. Um, thank you so much for your background and journey and walking us through that. Um, pivoting a little bit to go into examples of economic development, what do you see right now as some of the major trends in economic development? Absolutely. Well, I think it's a really exciting time in the economic development space. And that's because we're shifting away from this kind of zero sum mindset where, you know, companies are competing and where regions or cities are competing to have companies housed there and providing incentives. There's still, uh, you know, some of that that exists, but it's really now kind of looking at what assets do we have in our own community? How do we kind of grow those and retain those? And I think that's been a really exciting shift that you're starting to see. I think also this um, focus on equitable economic development, not just development for kind of select few. Um, because when you think about it, regions that are more inclusive, more equitable, are going to be faster growing. They're going to be more resilient. They're going to be able to tap into all of these previously untapped talent basis. Um, and so I think that's really exciting to see those efforts kind of come to fruition and be more prominent. Um, uh, in that vein, I think um, another trend that we're seeing is really this blending of workforce development and economic development. Um, historically, workforce and economic development were kind of thought of in, uh, as siloed and kind of separate but related. And increasingly, there's an understanding that you know, workforce is economic development. And, um, and and so really needing to be strategic about how we build the skill sets for the future, how we reduce barriers um, to people being able to get good jobs. And what we're seeing now are, you know, focus on things like wraparound support. So transportation, healthcare subsidies, reducing barriers to four-year college degrees, really as economic development strategies. Um, and then just, you know, one other thought here is, we're also seeing kind of a more regional approach. That was certainly the case at the Greater Washington Partnership. So not just viewing, you know, a county or a city, but being part of something larger and thinking about kind of how do you map assets um, in a broader geography and make those kind of, you know, interconnected in a way that um, can be really beneficial. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it sounds like you worked on numerous economic development projects across all these different geographies. Um, can you provide some of the examples of the work that you've done and like what regions can do to grow their economies? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll share um, an example from New York, an example from California, um, from my Deloitte consulting days. Um, so one of the projects I worked on was for the, the state of New York. And the goal was to build kind of a life sciences cluster strategy across the state. Um, Governor Cuomo had invested $620 million in this initiative. And why this was so important is if you think of, of New York, there's incredible hospitals, incredible research institutions, very high levels of NIH dollars. Um, but you, what you weren't seeing was those research dollars and those research facilities actually translating to commercial technologies. And that's important because it creates jobs. It spurs additional revenue, kind of eco drives economic growth. And so one of the key metrics that New, that New York was looking at was kind of this ratio of NIH dollars to VC, venture capital dollars. Um, and comparing that to places like Massachusetts and California, they were really underperforming. Um, and so we were brought in to kind of understand the landscape, kind of what assets existed, um, and then make recommendations and help to bring those, those recommendations to life on how New York could be more competitive. Um, so we did this by you know, gathering the data, mapping all the assets, having stakeholder interviews um, to, to really be able to understand what some of those challenges to kind of starting and growing a business in New York were. And, you know, that unveiled some really interesting things, I think unsurprisingly, cost of living in New York, extremely expensive um, to uh, ha have a business to be able to attract talent. Additionally, there was limited kind of wet lab space. So what you were finding is many companies would start in New York, but then they would go to New Jersey or to other areas where wet lab space was more accessible or cheaper. Um, and also, despite New York being kind of a finance epicenter uh, of our country, Many of the VCs that were life sciences, healthcare specifics, actually weren't located in the New York area. 
Um, so they would invest in companies, and one of the conditions to their investment would be that the company move their headquarters to a California or to a Massachusetts. Um, so you were kind of seeing challenges across every domain from um, you know physical space, talent, um, and the the financing for companies. So despite companies starting, they were leaving and not kind of growing and maturing um, in the local ecosystem. So how we thought about the solutions was was really kind of a, a multi-pronged approach. Um, the first was developing and bringing a accelerator program to New York. So um, Indie Bio, which is um, kind of the, the world's leading bio accelerator, opened in, in New York to really help incubate and accelerate um, startup companies there. Um, we also looked at kind of capital grants uh, to be able to develop wet lab and innovation space, mentorship programs to help better kind of connect the community, um, and then to, to also support incentives for companies that were starting. So I, I think, you know, as, as with any economic development strategy, there's no silver bullet, um, but it really requires thinking holistically about an ecosystem. Another example um, to give you a flavor of, of how you do that is in California. So I worked on a project in the Central Coast, um, so in the San Luis Obispo area. Um, and one of the challenges they faced there was high cost of living, kind of limited job prospects in the area. So many people that grew up there weren't able to, to find careers or afford to continue to live there or raise their families there. Um, so we really looked at what assets existed in the community today. And one of the things we found was Vandenberg Air Force Base. Um, and one of the strategies when you think about how do you commercialize, if you will, or optimize public assets was, you know, commercial space is a growing and large industry, both from a commercial perspective, but also you have kind of military uses of that as well. Um, and so really being able to turn a kind of historic asset that is that it has the infrastructure and equipment into a commercial spaceport, you're attracting new jobs, attracting investment. Um, and so what we did is kind of design the, the strategy, the business case for the Air Force Base. And when you think about it, um, it's also making sure that talent from local universities was well prepared, that they were getting apprenticeships programs, that there were internships available, and that there was that connectivity from curriculum to job. Um, also, you know, building out infrastructure to make sure that the Air Force Base was connected to city centers around there. Um, and then kind of, you know, there's so much as with all of these efforts is building the coalitions um, needed to drive this work forward. So that includes across political dimensions and business leaders and community stakeholders, really making sure that everyone understood the opportunity at hand. Yeah. So in these initiatives specifically, like how do you go about understanding a local ecosystem and identifying these opportunities? What type of information did you need? What were kind of like your first steps here? Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, you can't design solutions if you don't know what the challenges are and if you don't know what exists today. And I think that's one of the challenges that you see so often is um, we jump to, to conclusions or recommendations and um, we haven't kind of done the groundwork to gather that data, to understand what assets exist, what people and what organizations are are doing kind of on, on the ground. And so first things first um, is, is doing that data collection doing a, what I call like asset inventory, asset mapping, understanding the people, places, um, you know, initiatives of importance in a, a geography. And that helps kind of set the foundation and the groundwork. Um, but then it's actually doing that stakeholder engagement and soliciting feedback from people from different sectors and different lived experiences, because you really need that qualitative and that nuance um, layered on top of, of some of these more, more quantitative metrics, if you will. Um, so really sitting down with folks, understanding what's worked, what hasn't, and making sure that the people that you're engaging with are representative of the broader population, because otherwise you'll get a very skewed perspective. What do you see as some of the greatest challenges and opportunities in regional economic development right now? Yeah, so, you know, and, and sometimes a challenge is also an opportunity, but I would say that, you know, a challenge that, that still exists is growing inclusively. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to, to grow inclusively. It takes investment. It takes time. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, the creativity, I would say, it requires us rethinking our traditional ways of doing workforce development, of doing economic development. And so I think that is both a challenge and an opportunity. 
Um, to that same notion, think as, as you're what we're seeing for some of these, you know, federal grant opportunities where you're really bringing these coalitions of business leaders, of higher education, of nonprofits together. It's like, how do all these groups work together and have a shared vision and a shared prioritization? Because everyone has, you know, their own tasks, their own metrics, they're responsive to their board, their bosses. Um, but really what it requires is us all rowing in the same direction and having a shared vision of success. Um, and that's difficult. Um, and it's it's different from the way that, you know, have historic people have historically operated. And it also brings into question of, well, who's calling the shots? How are decisions made here in this kind of distributed or federated leadership model? So I think, you know, governance, if you will, is is a challenge um, on, on so many of these economic development initiatives. Um, duplication of efforts, I, I also think, and that goes to the need to do that asset mapping. And to really understand what exists in a given community so that you're not recreating the wheel. Sometimes it's a matter of finding those bright spots that exist, models that are working, and pouring more resources into them or helping them be scaled and adapted. Um, because, because we have a lot of the solutions today, um, but they're, they're subscale solutions. And then I think cross-sector engagement is also a, a challenge. Um, too often, we don't have, for example, business and academia at the same table thinking about this talent question. Um, and we all need to be co-creating these solutions because they're too big for any one sector to, to tackle alone. Opportunities. Um, I think right now we've seen in the Biden administration a historic investment in place-based federal funding. Um, we've seen that with the CHIPS Act with IRA. Um, we saw it with the Build Back Better regional challenge. And this is so exciting because it is an investment and a recognition that economic development and change happens at the local regional level. And these programs have also been structured in such a way that you have to have business at the table. It has to be cross-sector in nature. And it's really built to kind of address and, um, what a region's kind of unique strengths are and to build from those strengths. So I think that's really, really exciting. Um, and then what I talked about too, the, the blending of the workforce development and economic development, um, I, I think is, is just kind of a, a, a watershed opportunity for us now. For sure. And so with that, I know you just on this a little bit, how does taking an ecosystem mindset help those of us in the fields? Absolutely. Well, I, I think, you know, having an ecosystem lens, ecosystem approach is so critical for economic development because whether we're talking about housing or healthcare access or education or access to capital, entrepreneurial ecosystems, you know, these are all interconnected issues. And trying to solve one in isolation, you know, ultimately won't be productive because any individual's life touches all of these domains. They go to school, they take a bus, they drive, you know, and, and so we really have to think holistically. Um, and frankly, we'll be stronger together and ecosystem changes will enable this to be more sustainable in the long term um, versus kind of taking these isolated, you know, siloed kind of initiative level, programmatic level um, efforts. Totally. And pivoting us a little bit again into your experience um, at the Greater Washington Partnership, tell us a little bit more about your experiences there, um, where you were able to stand up the Inclusive Growth Initiative. Um, and if you could talk a little bit more about the partnership's mission and um, the work that led you there. Yeah, absolutely. So as I shared at the beginning, the Greater Washington Partnership is a CEO-led business alliance of the largest employers in the Baltimore to Richmond ecosystem. And the, the mission and vision is to create a thriving economy and an inclusive economy. Um, and the partnership was originally formed out of a failed Olympic bid, where you had many of these same stakeholders come together to compete to host the Olympics. And while that was ultimately unsuccessful, these leaders saw the value in taking a cross-jurisdictional approach to collaboration. Um, for those of you that aren't from the greater Washington, D.C. area, you know that Maryland, Virginia, and, and D.C. are kind of historically pitted in, in competition. And so really being able to think super regionally where commerce crosses state lines, talent crosses state lines, um, is so important. Even our, you know, our, our transit systems are, are jointly funded and interrelated. Um, and, and so that's kind of the, the premise of the partnership. It's focused on three key areas, 
um, workforce, uh, transportation, and inclusive growth. And as I mentioned, I was brought in to stand up an inclusive growth initiative. I think the pandemic shed a lot of light on the structural issues that exist in, in our society, and they increased kind of the, the racial consciousness. And so there was a, a increased recognition of the role that business can and should play to advance equitable growth. Um, and, and I think what was important about this and, and the framing is that um, it, this is also a business imperative and there are huge potential economic gains to fostering inclusive growth. Um, we conducted some, some research that showed that closing the racial wealth gap in this region alone could unlock up to $50 billion in GDP by 2028. So that was a, a huge call to action um, amongst the business community. Um, and uh, again, just knowing that inclusive economies are going to grow faster um, and going to be more sustainable in the long term. So at the partnership, you developed a regional blueprint for inclusive growth to outline the strategy for regional economic growth. Can you tell us why this effort was important and how you went about the process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we had a big, bold, audacious mandate, which was um, promote economic growth, equitable economic growth in the um, greater Washington region. Um, but we knew we needed a guiding framework and a strategy to be able to um, deliver on this vision. So um, we launched a year-long effort, engaged over 200 stakeholders um, during this year-long effort. And really what the, the Blueprint for Inclusive Growth endeavored to do was to set a 10-year vision and strategy um, for how the region could, could be a more inclusive economy. And it was premised on taking this data-driven approach, um, very similar to some of the tactics I described, understanding kind of what those pain points were in our region today across dimensions like healthcare, transit, housing. Um, we had kind of six, six key um, buckets of, of opportunity. And then also look at kind of what, what existed today in those spaces, what models were working, um, and to take a, a holistic approach there. Um, what, what we tried to do is we know that there are so many solutions that, you know, uh, that can drive inclusive growth and that can really move the needle. But we, through that kind of data analysis, tried to identify kind of the top things that we could do for this region in particular um, in each of those categories from housing to education. And um, these actions that we outlined as part of the blueprint spanned the gamut. Some were policy related, some were investments, some were convening and sharing of best practices, um, also tried to have a diversity of activity types. Um, uh, you know, to go about doing this, we held focus groups with subject matter experts in each of those categories. I think something that was really important in approaching this work is recognizing that there are organizations and individuals that have been working on these efforts for decades in our community. And too often we don't survey those individuals and they are the ones that have the greatest knowledge and the greatest solutions. And so as part of this year long effort, we held one-on-one -on -one interviews, larger focus groups. Um, we pressure tested hypotheses and went back to those same stakeholders to try to validate um, the thinking. And I, you know, I think what's, what's so impressive at the end is we came out with this, this plan, um, and it was signed by all of the CEOs, um, as part of the greater Washington partnership, which I think is a testament to their commitment and the value of this work. And this is really meant to be a blueprint for and by the region that can be adapted and be modified. It's, you know, not, not saying that every organization um, will see themselves reflected in every one of these recommendations, um, but it does help provide that data-driven guidepost. So in taking that regional focus, what challenges were there in bringing together common interests across different, um, like, diverse stakeholder groups? And how did you leverage data to highlight local voices and building this consensus around the recommendations that you presented. Absolutely. Well, I think you can never get full consensus because everyone comes from a different angle or a different lived experience. And, you know, it's unrealistic to think that we'll all agree on everything. I think what's the most important is that people want to be heard. They want to be acknowledged and seen. And so one of the things that we tried to do through the process was really to highlight 
what's working today and to showcase models of innovation happening in the region with hopes that by including those um, in the blueprint that we'd be able to spur additional investment or kind of showcase things that could be scaled, um, which was, was kind of a, a core premise. Um, and and I, I think, you know, other challenges is, again, having the right people at the table and kind of the representation of voices is, is so important to doing this work right. Um, what's exciting also about the blueprint is um, it helped provide that guidepost for activities that the Greater Washington Partnership could take on. And one of the things that was identified as a core place where the business community can can really lean in was around supporting diverse entrepreneurs and kind of diverse small businesses. Um, and that ultimately led to a commitment amongst Greater Washington board member companies of $4.7 billion over five years in investment in um, supplier diversity, um, community banking for those same diverse businesses and racial equity efforts. Um, and so I, I think what all this shows is the collective power of thinking holistically and acting together. Um, but it also highlights that you can't do that overnight, right? There is a lot of stakeholder building, a lot of consensus building, a lot of data gathering to make the case on why this is important why companies should share their data or talk to one another. Sometimes these were historic competitors. And so again, it's it's kind of debunking the um, traditional ways of working um, to really show how we can be better, stronger together. And if we have a focused effort that everyone is contributing to, we'll get that multiplier impact. Yeah, for sure. So looking ahead here and kind of reflecting back as well, um, you've worked in cities across the country and internationally. Have you seen commonalities across regions? Um, to what extent can cities and regions really like learn from each other? Or is it kind of that every region is completely unique? Yeah, I, I would say it's kind of a both and, if you will. Um, no two cities are exactly alike, of course. But there is so much that can be learned from the experience of others. I think what we're seeing today is that cities are grappling with you know similar challenges, be that housing affordability, homelessness, you know, congestion, um, remote workforce, um, and what learning from one another and creating these opportunities for people to share best practices or candidly, you know, share failure stories. I think sometimes we learn the most from things that did not work um, is that they provide a blueprint that can be adapted in other contexts. Um, I'll, I'll tell you about one of the groups I'm working with that I think is emblematic of this. Um, there's an organization called the National Talent Collaborative, which is a coalition of over 20 CEO business impact groups and chambers uh, across the country that are all working to advance shared prosperity locally and close the talent gaps. And you know, this um, effort formed kind of or organically where you had these regional leaders wanting to talk to others in the field to understand what had worked for them, what hadn't worked, how they structured their own organizations, how they should think about engaging in their regions. And that group over the past several years has really blossomed um, and now includes, you know, twice annual in-person meetings as well as quarterly we call them kind of CEO peer learning tables, um, where we'll have a leader kind of share a case study on something that they're a live challenge that they are grappling with and be able to solicit the thought partnership and thought leadership of, of others. Um, another um, organization I'm working with is the um, Bloomberg Center for Cities at Harvard University. And you know, that premise is, you know, how do we build capacity for city leaders and senior staff in cities um, and to provide the resources and the forums and the tools um, for folks to learn, grow and evolve. And so that really started with an executive leadership program where every year they'd bring a cohort of mayors um, in, in international and, and domestic together and kind of put them through this executive leadership program. Um, and what you found there and when you continue to find is, you know, how much people cherish the opportunity to understand and sit with others that um, have taken on these these same situations. So I think, um, you know, all, all that is to say cities are alike in, in so many ways, but you can't just lift and shift, right? You, you definitely do have to understand the city's unique flavor, the, the assets that exist, and the people that really have that social and political capital in place in order to be able to drive change. 
So given your wide variety of experiences there, how have you seen change happen at the individual and community level? And what makes you optimistic about this moment right now for local economic development? Definitely. Well, you know, I think change is the result of so many passionate, hardworking people um, coming together. And I think sometimes it's a game of inches. It can happen in pockets that builds and then cascades over time. And sometimes there are these kind of momentous big advances that you see. Um, but it, it does require, you know, it's it's the collection of individuals is really what brings about change. Um, and what makes me optimistic about this moment is this focus um, in the economic development space on starting from what we have. So really looking at kind of the competitive assets of a place. And that can look different. It can be a port. It could be a major healthcare system. Um, it could be, you know, a thriving biotech industry, but really like understanding what exists and then helping to build out from there or reduce the barriers to more people being able to innovate or access jobs there. Um, I, I think that's really exciting because it will allow us to, um, you know, grow at a faster clip and with more people partaking in that growth. The other thing that I'm really excited about is the historic federal investment in place-based efforts. And kind of one in particular that I, I'd love to call attention to is as part of the CHIPS Act, um, there is a, a program directed through the Economic Development Administration at the Department of Commerce called the Tech Hubs. And Tech Hubs, what they seek to do is kind of create technology-driven, globally competitive regional clusters outside of the traditional kind of coastal areas. Um, and this is both a matter of national security. These are technologies that the government has identified, um, you know, as, as being kind of priorities for, for our security and global competitiveness. But it's also an economic kind of imperative is, you know, how do we take these industries and allow them, allow them to blossom to promote sustainable growth? Um, and, you know, I think where Ecomap is based in Baltimore is a, a tech hub finalist, which is which is really exciting uh, to see. But, you know, I, I had the privilege of working with many of the finalists and, and regions on their tech hubs applications and their efforts. And what I saw is what gives me optimism, which you had unprecedented levels of collaboration happening locally. Um, you had business at the table with community colleges, with workforce providers with nonprofits that are deep at the neighborhood and community level. And you had folks rolling up their sleeves and sitting down um, to really kind of reach consensus or agreement on kind of what a shared vision would look like for their region. And then each thinking about what their respective role could be in driving that forward. And you saw companies and places making, you know, sizable commitments um, to these efforts, kind of whether or not um, they end up getting selected for a tech hub. So I think that's hopefully a harbinger of, of what's to come in these place-based efforts. For sure. So close us out a little bit before we get into Q&A. Um, what advice do you have for those leading community level change? What are the core individual and systemic principles for driving local inclusive growth? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think, you know, the first piece of advice I have is to listen. Uh, I think, you know, naturally, sometimes our, our inclination is to talk, um, but really observing and understanding is key um, to, to this work. I think also finding common interests is such an important skill set. Um, well, you can't be everything to everyone, but I think you'd be surprised about how much more we agree on than we do not. Um, but what that means in terms of forging that that kind of common vision, finding those common interests, is you have to speak in language and terms that each individual organization or sector understands. Um, so, you know, in the business world, it's really kind of being able to frame the ROI of an initiative, you know, how this can really kind of, you know, support their business because that that is important to, to the private sector. Um, for the social sector, it's really being able to think about the potential for impact. And so um, I think that's an important skill set is, is really communicating um, in, in ways that resonate. I think it's also, as I mentioned, kind of tapping into those community members that have that social and political capital um, and finding those nodes um, of influence in order to be able to build a coalition to bring an idea um, forward. And then, you know, I think also on a personal level, it's hard work 
it's long-term work, there's setbacks. And so really taking the time to recharge, um, to celebrate the wins, uh, because, you know, I, I think, again, there's, you know, it, it happens in inches, but there are wins along the way. And it's important to recognize and acknowledge those and, and lift those up and to surround yourself with with good people. Um, a, a kind of a few other principles, I think, is, you know, storytelling. Like so often we we think about the hard data and the hard metrics, but ultimately what we're trying to do is to shape lives and shape communities and to really bring that message home. A lot of times you need to bring those anecdotes to life, those vignettes about, you know, how people have experienced this or how their lives or their families' lives have been changed um, by access to a good job or transportation or healthcare um, to really kind of like lift, lift those up and show how all of this hard work is translating at the individual level. Also think in order to be successful, you have to have the right champions to the work, right? It's it's a top-down and bottoms-up effort um, in order to, to be able to bring this to life for, for the long term. And then I'll just close with, you know, I, I think economic development professionals, it's, it's a really rewarding career or anyone kind of leading, you know, local community efforts and to kind of like take take the time to delight in the opportunity that we all have to shape and form and, and build a better future for, for ourselves, our families, and our communities. Thank you, Francesca. These have been such valuable insights. Um, I'd love to open the floor for some Q&A, if that's okay. Um, let's see if we have anything coming in from the chat um, or from our LinkedIn audience. Um, if not, uh, we can definitely end a little bit earlier, but we can... Any final thoughts that you want to share with the group? Yeah, well, well, thanks so much again, uh, Maria, for this opportunity and for everyone to join in, joining. Uh, you know, I think you know what's been a core tenet of my life, and you know, I I hope is you know part of economic development. You know, going forward, is really the need to take this cross sector approach. That you know, in order to be able to affect systemic change. You have to, to have an ecosystem landscape because there are policy elements that are required. There are kind of programmatic or capital investments, and you need to have a thriving business community and a kind of robust social sector um, community to really be able to, um, to make communities the best that they can be. So I hope we all bring kind of this ecosystem mindset into, into our work, into our lives, and I think we'll find better results. Perfect. Thank you so much, Francesca. This has been very, very valuable. And um, thank you so much for your time. This has been great. Great. Thanks, Maria. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.